your organization. Uh, Ria from our team is also keeping time and we will be intimating speakers uh, accordingly. Uh, feel free uh, to leave your comments and questions in the chat box. As you hear, uh, we will be keeping track of them and we'll uh, intimate the moderator about them. And again, uh, to keep this place uh, sort of safe and warm, we are also open to hearing things in English or Hindi. So please choose uh, to use the language that you're comfortable in, and we'd be happy to switch. Most of the, all of the speakers kind of switch between the two. So that should be uh, all right for us. Uh, great. Uh, we're really pleased to welcome you uh, to the fourth session uh, for uh, Gender Colab. This is a virtual learning event on nurse midwives and really uh, centered around the question of how uh, nurse midwifery advances gender equity in health. Uh, gender Colab is a community of practice uh, set up in India uh, about a year ago from now uh, with the intention to advance gender intentionality in the health system. It's anchored by Oxford Policy Management and facilitated by Quicksand uh, with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, India Country Office. Um, gender Colab, uh, mostly lives on the internet. We are practitioners uh, based in different parts of the country and the world, in fact. Um, and, and the work that comes up and, and comes together through Gender Colab is recorded and documented on our website, www.gendercolab.in. Uh, you can look at the About page, uh, the Knowledge Center, which has uh, different sort of resources, uh, some reflections that are blogs, et cetera, as well as learning events that we've done in the past, as well as the list of the partners. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, go have a look at the website. And um, virtual learning events have been conversations that we've been hosting periodically. The first one was on enabling respectful care within the health system. Then we had a conversation on women's leadership in health. Then the third one was on nurse leadership. And today we talk about uh, midwifery and nurse midwives um, advancing gender equity in health. Um, before I uh, move on, this is just a quick introduction that I will make, then I'll pass it on to Dr. Anchita Patil from the Gates Foundation, who will set a bit of uh, the context for us. And then we'll have about an hour uh, long discussion between the speakers um, and then a moderated uh, Q&A. Great. Uh, without further ado, I'll briefly discuss uh, or briefly introduce the panelists uh, for this afternoon. We are extremely grateful uh, to have everyone on board. Uh, we really re reached out to you all and are so grateful that everyone could make the time uh, despite uh, everyone's busy schedules as well as uh, externalities that kept happening over and over. Uh, we first have Dr. Geeta Chibbar from uh, Japaigo, India. Uh, Dr. Chibbar is the technical lead for midwifery uh, at Japaigo India. She is a public health professional and an obstetrician and gynecologist with over 23 years of work experience, both in India and abroad. Uh, working closely with the national and select state governments, she has supported uh, the successful implementation at scale of several maternal, newborn, sexual and reproductive health programs in India. Welcome, Dr. Chibbar. We have Dr. Aprajita Gogoi from the White Ribbon Alliance and C3. Dr. Gogoi is an advocate for health and, and rights, working with a single mission uh, to make the lives of girls and women in India better. She is the executive director for C3, the Center for Catalyzing Change, an Indian NGO which works to enable women and girls to be fully empowered, equipped to realize their rights, access opportunities, and achieve gender equity. And she's also the global co-chair of the Global White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood. Welcome, Dr. Kukui. We are grateful to have Dr. Janavi Nilekani here from Astrika Foundation. Uh, Dr. Nilekani is trained as a development economist and works in the field of public health. Janavi is a 2018 alumni of uh, Harvard, where she completed a PhD in public policy. Uh, Janvi's personal experience with childbirth in India deeply inspired her to instigate change in the sector. And consequently, she founded Astrika Foundation in 2019, where she uses her background in academic research, public policy, and public health, and strives to instigate India-wide improvements in the quality of maternal health care. Welcome, Janvi. We have Ms. Indi Kaur from the Fernandes Foundation in Hyderabad. Uh, Inderjeet Indi Kaur is the director of midwifery at Fernandes Hospitals. Indi has held several strategic roles in her career at the NHS in the UK, 
She is passionate about reducing health inequalities of vulnerable, vulnerable women. She spent the last six years in India training professional midwives and providing clinical leadership to midwives in the Fernandez Foundation and the government of Telangana in India. She's, a, she's passionate about reducing maternal mortality via midwifery training and respectful humanized care for Indian mothers. Uh, in 2019, she received the Chief Midwifery Officer Gold NHS UK Award for outstanding contributions to midwifery. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Indy, for joining us. Great. Uh, we have Ms. Renuka with us. Uh, Ms. Renuka is a National Midwifery Educator at the National Midwifery Training Institute, NMTI, in Meerut. Ms. Renuka has over six years of experience in clinical work and teaching and four years of experience as a nurse practitioner midwife educator. Um, Ms. Renuka has a master's of nursing with specialization in obstetrics and gynecological nursing. And currently she's serving as an NPM educator, fulfilling dual roles at the NPMI, uh, N M NMTI College of Nursing, as well as the District Women's Hospital in Meerut. Uh, welcome Renuka. We're also really grateful to have Dr. Poonam Shivkumar, uh, who's the director of uh, obstetrics, gynecologics, gynecology and medical superintendent at the Kasturba Hospital, um, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences um, in Seva Gram, Bartha in Maharashtra. Uh, Dr. Shivkumar has had advanced training in SRHR from the Uppsala University in Sweden, the NTTC, JIP, MER, uh, and clinical skills training from the EMOC at uh, CMC in Bellore. Uh, she's a resource person and expert for the government of India and the government of Maharashtra for guidelines, for national guidelines development in maternal health, and is also uh, the nodal officer for the FBMDR committee. Uh, there's much more about all of these panelists. Uh, we are extremely grateful that they've been able to make the time to join us. Um, and without further ado, I will uh, sort of get going. <laughs> Uh, so thank you to all the speakers again for joining us. Uh, we now have uh, Dr. Anchita Patil speak with us a little bit about the state of nurse midwifery in India. Dr. Patil is a medical doctor and a public health expert with over two decades of experience in the RMNCH space. She currently is the MNCH lead at the India office of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Her current work involves supporting the translation of the latest global evidence on reducing maternal and neonatal mortality and improving the health of mothers and children to practice in India. Um, this is done by supporting grants that conduct implementation research to build evidence uh, around potential pathways for implementation. Um, and these are happening in specific sort of focus states in, uh, in India. And then she also provides, uh, and there's technical support that's provided to the public and private sector. Um, yeah. With that, I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Anchita Patil. Over to you, Anchita. Thank you, Rohan, and thank you, team, and the experts for like organizing this session. It's a topic very close to my heart, and uh, the linkages with gender issues are also very close to my heart. But given a bit confused about midwifery or you know the status of midwifery in India I thought let me just have three four quick slides on what exactly we are talking about so we did have a few programs uh, in the early 2000s and later where we were talking about uh, developing nurse practitioners in midwifery which meant that we were basically considering a lateral entry program where nurses underwent additional training to become midwives so in West Bengal, Gujarat, then sometime later in Telangana, and that was one successful model in uh, Fernandez Hospital. I know um, Indy is with us from the same place. Uh, and then some in uh, Madhya Pradesh also. The, the challenge there was that while a lot of these focused on the education bit, the other pillars of midwifery were not that well taken uh, into account. So... I would say these programs were partially successful and I'll come to some of the other things that we do need to take into account. The second thing was, you know, how we were defining midwives for some of these programs. It wasn't really in sync with the way ICM or the International Confederation of Midwifery defines it. Ron, can you move to the next slide, please? 
So for India, what we were noticing is that, um, you know, with a shift uh, of births to at the institutional level, we were seeing declines in MMR and India was, uh, in a sense, in terms of reduction, the global leader. However, this decline was not really commensurate with the rise in institutional delivery. So we are very, very close to, you know, even now uh, at about 85% institutional delivery rate. But our MMR is still very high and is, is at 97. And we are not close to the SDGs. And uh, I think somebody has their uh, mic on. I can hear an echo. I don't know if everybody else can too. Okay, it's gone. Thanks. Uh, so we are, we are and, and of course, there's a lot of regional disparity that is there. On closer inspection to the field, what we realized is while we may be treating the medical parts of, say, the condition, but were we really giving the women what they deserve in terms of quality of care? That wasn't, we weren't sure about that. We always knew we were short of HR. We definitely needed to ramp it ramp up our HR supply with the right kind of people. Uh, so in some senses, we were facing uh, in different places, a dual burden, you know, the way we talk about malnutrition as under and over nutrition. But even in this case, we were facing a dual kind of uh, uh, issue, where in some states and some geographies, we were seeing low institutional delivery rates, because of lack of human resource, skilled human resource, and at places we were seeing over medicalized care during delivery, you know, more interventions than required. The C section rate being a proxy indicator for this over medicalization. And when we explored further, we realized even that to a large extent is because of reduced numbers of skilled human resource that is available. So, because we don't have enough numbers, so we just want a quicker process. And, you know, we were going through a lot of medicalized route. So what could be a possible solution uh, was, you know, can you come to the next slide, please, Rohan? So to tackle, you know, in terms of quality and quality, both in terms of appropriate care, uh, as well as compassionate care. So from the provider lens, from the client lens, what we uh, decided, and by we, I mean the government of India, and you know, I was party to it, and uh, they decided on uh, taking up midwifery as a national initiative. And the guidelines were launched in 2018. Uh, next slide, please, Rohan. The change basically was, you know, that uh, what we had decided as part of this initiative, that unlike some of the previous initiatives, we would want to define midwifery the way ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives, defines it. And so they said a midwife is somebody who's trained to competence for midwifery. That's what it basically says. And, you know, has uh, the various elements of the scope of practice embedded into the training methodology. So what is that midwifery framework? Uh, Ro uh, next slide, please. I don't know if it's Ria or Rohan who's coordinating, but... Yeah, thank you. So basically, uh, unlike say the nursing card in general, you know, which um, I might sound like a bit uh, gender insensitive if I say this, but they were working more on the command from the doctors. Uh, and that's how the training was also designed. But here, what we are looking for was responsible and accountable, and it's an autonomous profession. So that is the kind of professionals that we wanted to build who not only you know worked on preventive measures but they basically you know partnered with the women to give them the quality of care that they desire and deserve so that was a thought behind this thing and that is why while they of course took care of normal birth and you know to a large extent reduced the dependence on over medicalization uh, they are also professionals and you know very much capable of detecting the complications and providing early management and or a referral as the case may be and that was the goal that was set out by the Indian guidelines to have this cadre in India and a long process was developed so along with the training the next slide please 
based on our previous lessons, what we uh, understand that, of course, a training, a meaningful training is important. Uh, but what we also need beyond the training ecosystem is other factors in place that in, that can set the context or the stage to enable the midwives to deliver uh, based on the scope of practice and you know what they were trained for exactly. So the policy environment has to be such that it uh, not only holds them accountable, uh, but gives them the autonomy to be able to practice. We need a regulatory framework so that all the licensing, et cetera, is in order. There needs to be a space allowing them to work, which is what we call the midwifery-led care units. And then as we proceed, we need to learn and make the needed changes because it's a national level program. It's unlike the other you know, uh, earlier interventions that were tried earlier, you know, which were like in a smaller geography, this was expected to go at the national level, still is. I mean, we are going slow. So we didn't really have the bandwidth of doing a pilot and, you know, correcting ourselves. We just had to learn on the go. And uh, of course, quality assurance is part of the whole deal. So if we had to take care of all these key components, it's only then that we could think of actually establishing midwifery in its truest sense in India. And that is what the guidelines envisaged. Uh, I don't think there's, a, there's another slide, is there? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So while I end my you know uh, background discussion here, and we can get on to the question to the panelists. Uh, uh, gender sensitivity, gender transformative care is very, very central. Is everyone else also to, losing? And I'm uh, going to be asking a few questions. I think uh, I'm sort of flickering in and out and not able to catch her clearly. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Maybe what I'll do is I'll turn off my video and save some bandwidth. Just give me a second, if that's okay. Okay, just tell me, is it better now? Okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, given the time that we have at hand, I'll be directing the questions to a few panelists and I'm lucky to know them all and I have met all of them in person. Um, so uh, the first question is, you know, while we understand what we are doing on midwifery, but when I've come across people, you know, they are by people, I mean, within the system as well as clients, they are a bit confused. The fact is that our earlier nursing terminology, whether GNMs or ANMs, also had the letter M, which stands for midwives or midwifery in it. So the question is, how is this particular initiative different from the nursing model or the medical model of care that we were providing? And what is it, how does it differ compared to ANMs and GNMs? And more importantly, if we can figure out this difference, how do you think we can communicate it? Because I keep on hearing things like midwives are just nurses with an extra training on RMC or respectful maternity care, or midwives also do, uh, you know, make mothers do yoga during pregnancy. And I'm like, I'm exaggerating it a bit, but not making it this up totally. Uh, so uh, maybe Geeta, Janvi, and Aprajita in that order, if you could answer. And please keep your responses to three to four minutes each. Thanks very much, Anchita, and thank you for setting that context uh, for this really important discussion. At the cost of sounding a little repetitive, I will draw everyone's attention to that definition of, um, you know, a professional midwife, which is so far removed from, uh, you know, what would be an ANM or a GNM. And I think drawing on some of the central features of that particular person who's going to be providing this model of care. So this is a highly qualified professional provider of maternal newborn health and reproductive health services who works autonomously within their legal scope of practice, who is accountable for consulting, collaborating, and referring, who has been educated to global standards where she, he is trained to be a critical thinker, reflector, decision maker, and someone who is really an expert in normal, but at the same time can recognize and identify complications as and when they recur, as and when they occur. 
So having looked at that and all the while providing this care within a very woman-centered model. So if we look at uh, the midwifery model of care, and if you actually just Google it, you will find that it is, you will get a host of sort of a um, uh, lot of information on that that will come up. So it's a very distinct evidence-based model of care, which upholds a unique philosophy of caregiving that's largely centered around four core tenets that the ICM puts. And I like to call them like the four pillars of midwifery and which which has really helped even when you're trying to communicate uh, the, the subtle nuances of this. So number one, you know, midwives apply a health oriented model as opposed to a disease oriented model. We're not looking at a pregnant woman as a diseased woman or pregnancy as a state of um, a disease or a woman who's a patient, right? And therefore she's somebody who's trained to support those normal physiological processes, working and promoting positive outcomes. At the same time, she can also anticipate and prevent complications. So midwifery care all along the way is very much informed by the evidence-based knowledge and practices. And a well-trained midwife would never insist on an absolutely not natural or a unmedicated care if a woman particularly needs it. The second being, midwifery-led care, which a midwife works in partnership with women, respecting the individual needs of each woman. So really, it's about partnership in caring and not providing care to the woman. It's working with her and embodying that relationship, which is very mutually trusting and respectful as well. The third, it's about promoting women's capabilities to care for themselves and their families. So really helping, supporting, developing that freedom and power to make that informed choice. And the fourth, which is, I think, which is just gets kind of completely missed out is having a collaborative approach between midwives and other healthcare professionals while working within a multidisciplinary context. So ensuring that you are providing individualized care, holistic care to meet every individual woman's needs. So it's really an and model and not an instead of model of care. And to that extent, when you look at it and you see the spectrum across which the professional midwives are expected to provide care and they are trained, licensed, educated, regulated, even within India to provide that care all the way spanning from antenatal and to postnatal and beyond. I think it's quite distinctive, both as a cadre as well as a model of care, which makes the shift away from that very medicalized way of looking at things to looking at the, the focus being on looking at normality. And I think no better than Aprajita to be able to respond to your question, I think, which was on how do you communicate that? So over to you, Aprajita. Janavi, do you want to go next? Sure, sure. Happy to. Definitely. I think communicating difference is a challenge, which you're better positioned to speak about. Um, in general, I think to answer the original question, I would say there's a vast difference between nurses and midwives. I do very much agree, Dr. Anshita, that this is a confusion. Definitely in society, among policymakers, among the medical system, there is a vast degree of confusion and communication is a challenge. And I'm eager to hear Dr. Aprajita talk more about it. But, um, you know, to compare a GNM to a midwife, in, in some ways, it's like comparing an MBBS degree to a specialization. The depth of training that a midwife will get in the field of maternal and child health and especially in terms of prenatal, uh, interpartum and postnatal care is vastly more. So Asika Foundation, for example, we do training programs for nurses um, on respectful maternity care or on alternative birthing positions. So we do two-day workshops. We have a lot of online training modules. And at the same time, we also do full-fledged 18-month programs for both midwifery faculty at in Bangalore's National Midwifery Training Institute or for midwives, such as the one we, have, we are working with the government of Karnataka in Mysore. And the depth of training between an 18-month program and a two-day program is not comparable. Um, the level of specialized knowledge that a midwife will have a professional midwife in this space is far more than uh, you know a nurse trained in the medical model who may well have some degree of training and knowledge about maternal health, but will not have that level of immersion. Another big, huge difference I see between the medical model of care with nurses, even if they've been trained in respectful maternity care, versus the midwifery model of care is how absolutely critical women's rights, respectful maternity care, and mother-centric care are to midwives. You know, ensuring that mid every mother receives women-centric care is at the core of the midwifery model that first and foremost, you have to ensure that each woman gets respect, that they, you take the informed consent for uh, decisions, that they're treated as mothers, not as patient as much as possible, and that that woman's well-being is treated extremely as a core priority. 
So the, the extent to which this is emphasized in the midwifery model is something really unique. Um, midwives, as Dr. Gita also was mentioning, they are trained to take autonomous decisions within their scope of practice. And one of the great developments in India in the last few years is that there is now a very clear defined scope of practice from the central government on what a professional midwife can do. And if one goes into it in depth, again, it is far broader than what in most cases is in the nurse's scope of practice. There is, They are given more autonomy, or at least they have the potential to be given a lot more autonomy in the system and to know when to refer, but when they're not referred. So for example, in a midwife-led care unit as it's running in, in Bangalore or in, in Sebagram, um, in midwife-led care units, the midwives are genuinely taking the decisions. And that is one of the things which I think we don't yet see in nursing, even in more advanced training nursing, we don't see that in India. When nurses are trained to largely either stick to protocol or follow guidance, but midwives are trained to a level where they're expected to autonomously take their own decisions to drive the situation independently and in particular to take responsibility for patient outcomes as well. Um, sorry? Was that for me or just some background? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, nothing. I'll just go on. Um, yeah, and I think one another final big difference that I would see is that the midwifery model ends up being very evidence based, partly because midwives, the midwifery model starts from the premise that birth is physiological, it's normal, it's evolutionary, and definitely midwives do often intervene, but they are, they typically intervene only in places where there's strong evidence of benefit where research has shown that, say, for example, active management of the third stage of labor or um, vaccines, perhaps. There are various interventions which midwives do promote often, um, which typically are interventions where there is a decent amount of evidence that this actually works. And as long as there isn't strong evidence of success, midwives default to letting the physiology take its course. And this winds up being you know, very much more evidence-based than the medical model of care, which where often practices are in place to a great extent because they have been in place for decades and people continue to be trained in that, but there isn't such a focus on questioning whether or whether we ought to intervene at all. Midwives are more reluctant to intervene unless there's strong evidence that you should intervene uh, versus the medical mo model is a bit more used to intervening regardless and that, that is how the model has been, has been for a long time. Um, so all of this put together ends up leading to quite a difference in women's experiences with a midwife or, or a maternity care center. Um, and we are very excited to be part of this movement to, to lead to more with midwives in India. We at Astuka. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Janvi. That was beautiful. Uh, Aprajita, do you want to come in and tell us, you know, we know we understand these differences, but how do we communicate to the world as Janvi also agreed, you know, that we are seeing that confusion abound when we talk to people. What exactly is midwifery? Uh, thank you, Anchita. And I think uh, it's really opportune time for us to talk about this, um, recognizing the fact that we are talking today to the converted. Um, you know, we have devoted much time and immersive research in trying to solve the question of how do you communicate this distinction? How do you promote the midwifery model of care? And we have worked with you, Anchita, with BMGF, BMGF support as white women in C3. You know, and I think what we have arrived at is that when you are trying to communicate, first of all, lead with the evidence. There is evidence which tells us that midwifery is a pathway to reducing MMR and NMR. There is evidence which talks about, you know, how midwifery reduces over medicalization. And there is evidence that midwifery led care is cost effective, uh, more cost effective compared to obstetric led care. And I think the Lancet series, I think 20, 2014 talked about how midwifery has the potential to prevent I think more than 80% of maternal and neonatal deaths globally including stillbirths so I think like I said we should lead with the evidence that points to how midwifery can benefit um, and it can improve our health indicators but I think just the evidence may not be enough uh, in we have to recognize that NPMs in India it's a new cardo it's a lateral kind of an entry into the health system um, we have to build support and buy in for midwifery led care models. Uh, we have to not only ask for acceptance uh, from you know, stakeholders in the health system, but also acceptance from women. We have to drive demand. And in order to do this about you know, after the NPM initiative was launched, uh, we conducted more than 15 depth uh, interviews with new mothers, with potential NPMs, nurse, nurses, doctors, OBGYNs, experts, I think about 
uh, across eight states. And we really wanted to find out from them that how could you best communicate this particular model. And what we heard from everybody and the kind of the recommendations that we put forward to the midway free task force was primarily that we have to be very careful in highlighting the distinctions and we have recommended three distinctions one that you know midway free led care is specialized care it is care provided by professionals who are exclusively trained in end-to-end -end maternal and newborn care and the goal is a normal birth and as Gita had said provided inside a collaborative care model so the, I think the first distinction is talking about specialized care the second one is of course about women-centric care uh, midwives provide care which respects women's choices concerns to provide what works for her and at her pace and we feel that this particular message is really important for women who would whom we would like to choose midwives for their births and I think the third core distinction is compassionate care now, midwives provide care which extends beyond physical, emotional, and mental well-being of women. You know, they provide continuous companionship. They're there to walk that particular very difficult walk with women. Um, alongside, we also kind of recommended that we have to be very, very clear about what it is not. Uh, in order to make this distinction, you know, it is very important that we state upfront and upright that what that midwifery free is not a replacement nor is it a gatekeeper to OBGYNs. Midwives are not an assistant to OBGYNs. Midwives are not just an advanced general nurse, but midwifery in itself is a separate track. But also recognizing that it's not a one stop solution, again, going back uh, to the fact that it works within a collaborative model. And I think in India, there we also had to dispel a lot of kind of miscommunication and misconception about uh, will the NPMs be the traditional revival of you know uh, traditional midwifery in the country? Dies wapas aage hai kya? Was something that you know is our NPMs a better version of dies? Is something again we had to look at. Uh, but I think just to end this particular kind of uh, response to uh, your question, Anchita, um, I think. In order to make this distinction, to sum up, you know, we have to talk about how midwives provide an end-to-end -end care through dedicated maternity care unit. That is a sort of collaborative model that midwives offer kind of innovative methods for pain management, for emotional care, for companionship. But I think we also need to really push that, uh, you know, it involves autonomous decision making but it is within a medical legal responsibilities because a lot of pushback comes about you know what will happen if something goes wrong and i think we st in india we're still not very clear about medical legal responsibilities and this is something that remains as a not fully answered element i'm going to stop there and hand it back to you anchita thank you prajita i think the points that you made and you basically summarized it and gave us certain audiences to whom we communicate this. So we need to uh, communicate it not just to uh, the, the women and the community at large, but also to the program uh, managers within the system uh, and be it public or private health sector, and also to the other cadre of providers. So that kind of a messaging, I think, is is very, very important. And thank you for flagging that challenges still remain. And just going back to that, what we love to call our Gulawala slide, you know, all the different elements, that legal element of, um, you know, the accountability as well as, um, uh, uh, what was the other term? Um, missing it so autonomy sorry it has to be like legally account you know uh, there and only then and there therein lies a lot of gray area as of now which we need to figure out because that is very very important to get this whole thing in shape so let's come to our next question um uh you know whenever we are especially for a new carder training becomes super important and uh, like I said, generally becomes the mainstay of what we are trying to do. But given that we are looking at a different kind of model of care, how does the training for this cadre differ from, say, the training for nurses and maybe even for doctors? And how is it designed? And I'm going to be talk 
talking to people who undertake the training, who have been trained and undertake the training, as well as, you know, talk to Dr. Poonam, who can, because she's leading an institute, but also try and understand from her how different it is from the other training models is, you know, what, how have we been able to set up, because it's a hands-on training. So how have we been able to set up an environment, you know, that reflects this very, very strong change in philosophical thinking? So I would request maybe uh, Indi, if you could go first as a trainer, then Renuka, and then uh, Dr. Poonam. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and it's it's a, a, a good question, very uh, close to my heart, because I do, uh, I've been here for six years, and the training which differs, the methods for, for midwifery, it actually embodies and impart or women-centered philosophy, uh, centering around gender empowerment, recognizing of women's reproductive rights, voice, and agency. That is the core because it's, it, as part of the training, uh, especially with the vulnerable women, we realize that women in India, some of them do not even know the basic human rights. So it's really important to bring that in. The proficiency of trained NPMs in reflecting this philosophy you know, in their training and learning is gauged through case scenarios, continuity, following a woman and a newborn and the families through, having antenatal care. So it's not just intrapartum. The antenatal period is crucially very important and the midwives have been trained how to screen, how to look at the first assessment with a doctor initially because the scope is not there for a midwife yet. To, to do the first appointment. But the e reflections, evaluations, and feedback mechanisms through the training programs is vital. But interactions with women and the communities, talking to women, it provides the invaluable insight on how midwifery care and feedback, women's experiences, as what Janavid has said, is really important. That is crucial to midwifery-led care and midwifery care. The feedback from those who have directly experienced midwifery care have highlighted the impact and effectiveness of their practices. Um, and also, you know, the inclusions of birth companions is so important as well. So the training is very much hands-on. It's clinical leadership. And midwives need to be trained by midwives as well because the philosophy is totally different, as you have heard. The medical model is different. And equally, uh, midwives here in Fernandez are also training Fiji students because they spend time with the midwives in the midwifery-led care because this needs to be translated uh, in the medical model of care because, you know, it'll take India a long time now to get midwives. So it's important that we doctors imbibe the philosophy. And I like what uh, Aparajita has said. We are not assistants to OBGY, but we work we work collaboratively and we are colleagues and this needs to be translated through the training, uh, encouraging our midwives to have healthy discussions, have, having a healthy discussions and discussing a case scenario is powerful because it's not being disrespectful, but you're caring for the women, her family and the newborn. So it's midwives are advocates. So the training needs to imbibe being an advocate for women and their families. So, that's that's the the ethos of the training. Uh, I think it's really important. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks, Indy. Uh, so, Renika, you have been like you know trained on nursing, then on midwifery, and now you train other uh, midwives also, and that's part of your role. How have you found this training to be different? And you know, this what Indy was talking about, this whole focus on uh, being with the women and understanding a woman's rights. How do you see that change in the training and maybe because it's a hands-on care in the service delivery that you provide? Uh, yes, ma'am, thank you uh, for this question. Ma'am, uh, what I have realized that, uh, that uh, we know all that uh, this midwifery is quite new uh, and in its initial stage in India, and um, we uh, we have uh, relearned many things. Whatever we had learned earlier while while we were as a nurse, we have forgotten few things and started learning new things 
to understand the the normal physiology of a uh, mother ma'am with that uh, the resource packages are designed in such a way to keep the core uh, philosophy of midi free according to the standard of IC icm competencies in that uh, informed choices autonomy in decision making respectful maternity care protecting the right of women and children cultural sensitivity are integrated and ma'am as these npm learn through 18 months training and they practice it in msu and in opd uh, the changes we can it is visible through their practices through their behavior and it is getting reflected through their attitude even the impact of empathy and compassionate care uh, they do on the women made them to realize that they are doing something different than they were doing earlier even i also felt in the same way when i uh, started a learning what is midi free is and this process of change is truly remarkable and indicative of the gradual evolution within the field of midi free in india yes of course ma'am there is a long way to go but a small small changes will make the difference that was i understood thank you thank you so much renuka it's 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 good to know you know that early getting translated and then transmitted across uh dr poonam uh, one of the nmtis or the national midwifery training institutes is has a clinical site within your training institute so as an obgyn what would you say about you see this training and what would you say about how different it is say how doctors are trained how maybe nurses may be trained and what shift do you see in terms of women care i wouldn't even like to call it patient care but women care in uh, the facility that you manage and what has the training got to do with this so thank you so much anchita this is a question which i would really like to answer because you know the way we have seen this whole training uh, during our first uh, uh you know the when the midwives came and the way things were so i would put it in such a way that normally you know you have four components of uh, uh three components of training cap you say knowledge attitude and practice but when you talk in terms of midwifery you also talking about something called technical and social aspects in the training now when we say knowledge training of course uh, there is a full curriculum which has been developed uh, the whole scope of practice has come in and uh, it includes national uh, uh, requirements also and of course the international requirement which we were not aware of so all those things have come in so theoretical part is extremely important because people should know what exactly they are doing and what is this whole course meant for but the attitude part of it which was lacking you you talk in terms of obstetricians or very sorry to say that being an obstetrician or you talk in terms of nurses the attitude was something which was actually missing but this particular training 100% talks about the attitude and i really appreciate the way midwives take care of the women a uh, third part of it is practice and this is the core of the midwifery training the reason being that uh, unless they have worked in the mlcus which is midwifery midwifery led care units uh, dealing with the low risk pregnancies uh, 100% they have to know what and how they are supposed to deal with this women and we categorically say that none of these midwives come to the mlcu without going to the skills lab doing each and every Uh, you know process procedures everything on the mannequin and then they come back and this is what we say is humane approach which is very different and now it has come on to the obstetricians and the nurses everywhere it is coming up what's very important part of the training is which we learned while we were training these midwives is the technical and social part of it where interprofessional collaboration every one of us is talking about it so to begin with when we started you know there was lot of chaos people were not agreeing obstetricians were not agreeing nurses were not agreeing uh, everywhere there was there was a fear that you know my part of it is going somewhere 
but you know uh, they say that uh, you know give one food and everyone comes together so we just had one lunch and everybody came together and when they started discussing with each other they realized that this cater is not to you know steal somebody's job it is to help it is to you know promote support and so many other things so this was something which was a learning and these uh, NMEs and, and uh, PMs have to learn this, that, that interprofessional collaboration is mandatory. And without that, you know, uh, these legal actions and medical legal issues are going to be too many. Uh, another important thing is what we learned uh, uh, during this training was that uh, the kind of supportive and emotional care you need to give to the women and that changes her whole scenario. You know, that kind of support, non-pharmacological methods of uh, giving uh, giving pain relief. Pain relief. So those things uh, completely change the scenario. The cervix dilates faster and the, uh, the women delivers uh, very easily. So those kind of things is again a learning. Also, uh, remember that this midwifery is not only intrapartum, which is a common concept. We alternate birthing, we will do and we will do this and this is midwifery. No, midwifery is not that. Midwifery begins from antenatal period. You have an antenatal OPD. You teach them exercises. You tell them what, uh, how they can have a natural birth. And that comes, uh, the, those midwives are then followed, you know. They come to the intrapartum area. They deliver the women. They give something which is called patient-centered, family-centered community care, which is something very different. Very small example, uh, you deliver the women bring the husband inside with all infection prevention precautions and then let him cut the cord and you see how things change completely. You know, they both become responsible. They both want to, you know, uh, treat the child as their own, uh, uh, you know, what I can do better, what you can do better. So the family completely changes. So that is something which they learn. They are also very helpful in triaging. You know, when the women comes, okay, this is low risk, this is high risk, this goes here, this comes here. So triaging also, uh, uh, they, the, the, these are the people who can help you in triage. And of course, when you talk in terms of, uh, you know, integrating the system, facility readiness and all that. So these are some technical uh, parts also which need to be trained uh, to these women. And while giving the training, only these things are stuck. So this is what is my whole concept of training and very different training as compared to uh, what you give to the uh, obstetricians and the nurses. Last point, uh, you see, when we are talking about this training, we have to look into certain aspects. Number one is infrastructure. You can't expect the low risk labor room to be at one place and high risk labor room to be at another place. So, you know, people are running around and then there will be no support. So the infrastructure part of it has to be looked into while you are training them. So MLCU's creation has to be near the uh, labor rooms which are being managed by the obstetrician. Second important thing is that, uh, you know, the curriculum, the learning methodologies have to be very different here. You are doing an adult training. You can't expect that, you know, blackboard and whiteboard will be good enough. It should be very different methodology, interactive sessions. We had group discussions. We called our bioethics team to talk about bioethics. We called our infection prevention team to talk about it, uh, even when you are taking the theoretical classes. And of course, when you're talking about practicals, please take them to the places where you can show them how things are done. Like, you know, when we started with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the en en enemies, uh, we were already doing alternate birthing position. So the first uh, hydro labor, when they saw, they realized that how good it is. But when they learned it, believe me, we learned from them that how you should do hydro labor. So even though we were doing, but the kind of concept is there. And that time we had international midwifery also. But then now our Indian midwives, whoever 30 we have trained the educators, they are good enough to train uh, further. So with that, I would like to stop. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think this is, it It really gets me to the point where uh, more than classroom education, we actually uh, learn 
uh, by doing and by observing our teachers and mentors. So one point that was, I think, also put in the chat that midwives should be training midwives because they embody that ethos. So that ethos should get translated. And of course, that it's not just a theory or practical of what to do, but how to get things done and changing that kind of a lesson is super, super important. So thank you, uh, three of you, for this. Uh, Gita, I'll, do you want to speak to the training package? I can see your hand up. Yeah, no, I just was just a quick uh, point sure. to what was made on this, given the fact that, you know, we, um, so Japaigo was tasked with the development of a learning resource package that would be aligned to developing these competencies and, you know, um, incorporating all of these elements that Dr. Poonam just spoke about. But apart from having a very different adult centric training approach, I think one of the things which we have realized seeing two sites uh, fully operationalized both at Parda and Merit is that having an identifying champion obstetricians really, really is very supportive. So we had one person already there at Varda, so that wasn't really a problem. But I recall in Merit, you know, when you, Dr. Poonam spoke about having infrastructure and Renuka can perhaps, uh, you know, remember that, that it was actually really almost a fight that one had to put up to have a, a room that could be dedicated to the midwives where they could start seeing women in the antenatal period and getting that infrastructure to the point when it's co-located you know within it's not uh, it's, you're housing it very close to uh, where all the other services are being provided so you're saying that they're distinctive but at the same time they're not far removed has made a huge impact because 80 percent of this curriculum in any which ways is very practice focused so these are that's that's again a very important part of uh, you know ensuring that you're getting the right uh, products out thank you Absolutely, Gita. And I can also, you know, see, I was uh, seeing who all were attending and I could see Dr. Evita also online. So another champion obstetrician uh, we have in our midst, and I'm sure Indy can talk more about that if required. Uh, it's just that we are short of time. But you do bring, but I remember also Dr. Evita pointing out to exactly what you said, you know, uh, between the midwifery-led units and the OBGYN-led units, there, were, there was like a corridor closed with doors. And she said, it's both the door and the corridor that was important. So that physical separation, uh, which makes you think about autonomy of practice as well as for the woman, but also that corridor that establishes collaboration which is super important, which actually brings me to the next question. And uh, Renuka, I think where you learned, you did not initially at least have that um, advantage of having a champion midwife in the beginning. Uh, uh, sorry, a champion OBGYN in the beginning. That's what I meant. So given that it's a relatively new cadre coming from a space that is relatively unknown in the country of uh, and because we are getting on board nurse, nurses into the training, so it is a lateral entry. Uh, you know, it's it's very different and it requires an acceptance from the different cadres that are already there. So um, as part of your learning, you know, what have you learned about the challenges that you have faced while working on the midwifery model of care in an environment that has more than one type of professional and how did you overcome some of that so were you able to get that sense of autonomy from the beginning if not what really worked for you thank you so much ma'am uh, you're on mute renuka can you unmute you just went on mute again thank you uh, am i audible yeah. yes yeah Ma'am, uh, this was one of the important questions because when we are posted in a uh, medical model of uh, environment search, so uh, there are a number of challenges. Actually, the acceptance of NPM within medical model uh, depends upon the hospital culture, policies, and attitude towards mid midwifery. Some hospitals may embrace and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, others may, like an integral part of maternal health, while others may view it as a skeptical or resistance, like uh, NPM, uh, they were encountered various level of uh, you know acceptance and resistance also from colleagues, uh, administration, and a patient. 
which influence their overall uh, experience. But ma'am, so uh, what will, is the solution? Because we have faced all those things. And thereafter, I think uh, strengthening interprofessional collaboration, promoting evidence-based practices and advocating for women-centered care are essential strategy for enhancing the role and impact of NPMs in hospital setting. On the other hand, I think that uh, uh, effective communication, mutual respect and recognition of each profession expertise and essential for fostering collaborative environment is very, very essential, ma'am. Because after all, we all work for a uh, single purpose that is to for the mother's welfare. So uh, lastly, I, I would like to say that um, this uh, autonomy is quite far because we are working towards it. But we hope in future, um, uh, as with practicing with more skill, confidence, we will have a harmonious relationship within the hospital, even in a medical model of uh, hospital type. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Renika. So I'm presuming you've already sensed a shift in terms of acceptance from uh, not just, say, the doctors, but the other nurses within the system. And you're gradually getting more and more accepted. And I'm just hoping as this tribe grows, uh, we you will not only be accepted, but you know maybe brought on board as experts to teach people about just being respectful and thinking about human rights overall, other than you know the clinical side of things, which many people know, but it's this element that seems to be missing. So thank you very much. Uh, so just, and this one last question, um, you know, is actually to everyone on the panel. So as we've just heard, I view midwifery as being gender transformative. And it's gender transformative, not just for the women we care for, for the communities, you know, this whole health system intends to serve, but also for its own providers. Because more often than not, Midwives are women. I'm not saying we are debarring, but though our current policy maybe debars men at certain level, it's not explicitly mentioned, uh, you know, male nurses from coming into this. But how, how do you think, you know, it changes lives for the healthcare providers, reducing the gender disparities? And how will this work towards some reducing some of those gender inequities for women and for communities? And I would just like to say like Puna Man did, uh, you know, give a beautiful example of the man uh, or the husband or the partner coming in to cut the cord. And that probably is the beginning of parenthood for him, which was otherwise restricted to motherhood. You know, fatherhood seems seem to be a very different concept. And now we are like, we want to go move into parenthood. So from a community, that was a beautiful example. Anything else, you know, any examples that you want to share of how it's been transformative and um, what what have you seen? And it's open to all panelists. Anjita, would you like to decide the speaking order? Maybe that'll help if you just nominate. I mean, they could raise their hands. I really don't want to decide the speaking any. Okay, Janvi, we have the first speaker. <laughs> so I think, you know, we midwifery has, uh, in the context of the midwifery guidelines, people have talked a lot about, and, and you brought it up in the beginning of your slides as well, about both um, lack of HR, lack of skilled human resources, so midwives can address that gap a bit, as well as um, to an extent, you know, the fact that there are escalating C-section rates, what, as you mentioned, the dual challenge. But one thing I want to highlight is that the fact of the matter is that disrespect and abuse in labor rooms remains rampant across the country at many, many segments of society. I think Definitely, sure, it has come down, but be it physical violence or slapping or pinching or much more commonly, perhaps verbal abuse in labor rooms remain very, very, very common. Lack of privacy, lack of confidentiality, lack of even a curtain or a blanket in many cases for a mother. So, um, and, and if you look at reporting on disrespect and abuse, it seems quite clear that often the situation in labor wards or in maternity departments is worse than in mixed gender departments like orthopedics or oncology or whatever. And it, that's coming partly from the gender challenges we face in India that, um, you, you know, people feel more disrespect and abuse is able to persist longer in, in maternity care, perhaps. 
So I think having a, a cadre of people like midwives for whom ensuring respectful maternity care is so critical and core to the, the, the understanding of the cadre itself of just is that itself will be gender transformative to put respectful maternity care informed consent front and foremost because these kind of things are lacking even in elite hospitals yes you will not have uh, you may not get slapped or pinched or something but fear based consent as opposed to informed consent for 101 procedures is happening all the time which is a lot of disrespect for women's bodies so i think that's one of the things i'm most excited by both by midwifery but also the increasing movement towards mainstreaming respectful maternity care in india you know, people like Vitamin Alliance have done so much for it and many others in this panel. And um, I'm ex especially excited that if you look at the recent government policies, they have consistently prioritized RMC, be it Lakshya or Suman or the midwifery guidelines. So at least at the high level, at the policy level, it is in place, it is in the right track. It's a question of all of us working together to implement. Anjita, I can go next. Uh, yes, Aprajita, please. So by saying ditto to what Janavi just said, you saved me time by not really kind of you know talking about respectful maternity care. I'm going to kind of divert a bit and talk about you know why we need to also look at gender inequities that impact midwives themselves. And in reality, world over, uh, women's labor often remains unseen, underappreciated, subject to stereotypes. Uh, it's always deemed less valuable compared to women's work the patriarchal structures that govern our lives also uh, you know disempower midwives and also the women who are under their care so i think we really need to look at how do we help midwives deal with this inequity uh, because they also encounter all the forms of discrimination uh, that you know women do overall so i really want you know a conversation to also focus on that you know, we had done the What Midwives Want campaign with SOMI and TNA and other partners where we asked about 11,000 midwives across 28 states and three union territories about what is it that you want for midwifery-led care to be successful in India. In India, what is it that you want? And one of the highest asks was midwives really asking for autonomy, for recognition, for non-discrimination and leadership roles. And they want to occupy spaces which really enables them to contribute to policy program decisions about midwifery. And I, I just want to end by saying that, you know, you know, we have the NNMC Act uh, 2023, which is talking about midwifery commissions at state level, national level. And we I think we really have to position it such that it, our midwives are occupying some of these different leadership positions, not just at the state, but also at the national level, we have to kind of help facilitate wherever we can so that the leadership positions mostly kind of occupied by male doctors historically or male bureaucrats or you know someone uh, somebody from the nursing field i think we while we focus on helping our midwives uh, you know create a career pathways uh, address medical legal issues scope of practice all of that but i think we also need to very intentionally fight for the fact that midwives need to be positioned on these leadership roles in order to ensure equity. Back to you, Anjita. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I could go next. Yes, Gita, please. Yes. So a uh, ditto, ditto, a double ditto, ditto to Janavi as well as a Prajita again makes life very easy. But um, what I would say is that if that whole respectful maternity care that we're talking about, if that can actually be seen from the lens of an experience of care and captured more in terms of a client-centered approach and nothing speaks louder than data, you know, so if we can actually bring up that and say that, in fact, we've seen this happening anecdotally as the shift which uh, Renuka spoke about that was that as more and more women who opted for the midwifery model of care who came back, many of them came back postnatally looking for the women in pink, looking for that particular person who had helped and birthed them, you know, with smiles and they have these beautiful group pictures, etc., which they got done well after they didn't need to come back. They were there for routine immunization or something else and they came back to the respective midwives I think that is where that would put a stop to certain 
you know, questions or skepticism, even within the own carder. I've heard so many nurses say, so what is it? I mean, you know, people have spoken about being almost mocked. Oh, so you're ma massaging somebody's back and that's supposed to be good quality of care. You know, not realizing, and since we're so obsessed with clinical outcomes, that how do each of these actually impact those clinical outcomes? Again, at the policy level, you've heard things like saying, Lancet to to theek hai. Wo sab to bahar ki baate hai. You know, talking about the Nordic countries which have brought their MMRs and NMRs back down to single digit figures. But really, are we, you know, again, very patriarchally, but hamare yaan to farak hai. So what your farak hai to be able to bridge that farak and that gap that we're talking about, I would say investing in midwifery education is so score and central so that you really are producing a cadre that is skilled, licensed, regulated, and can practice to those standards to embedding them within an enabling health system, working to give them rather than having them to fight every single day as an existential reality for them, to be able to work with policy makers and also have invest more in nurse leaders themselves or midwifery leaders rather I would say I don't want to conflate the two terms here looking at you know investing in uh, leadership roles so that they themselves can carve out those enabling policies and programmatic interventions thank you thanks Gita Indy thank you um, I agree to um, each and every one of you uh, and also, uh, to me, I think equity is so important because through this training, uh, I've seen some of our trainers and learners not getting paid. Now, as part of as part of a group of women, uh, pay structure is also important. And and I've witnessed throughout the training and some valuable members of the staff they're not continuing because of the way they're treated. And I think needs to happen from the beginning, uh, which, which is really important. And of course, leadership. Leadership is crucial. Um, and our structures still don't uh, allow in some places male birth companions. And I think what Janavif says is so, so vital and all of you, because uh, if you have companions, then the disrespect and abuse will also be reduced because somebody is there and women are not so vulnerable. Just some of the points I feel that's really important and the pay structure is equally important because they are women. Absolutely. Can I go next, Sanjita? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, uh, we all know, I mean, it's nothing new when we say midwife, we are talking about with women. And as very rightly said that amongst the midwives, even the national policy, we are only wanting females. So there are cultural issues, 100% but there are states where you know all male gynecologists are doing very well so I don't think uh, we should really limit ourselves only to the female midwives but that's national decision and we really need to talk to policy makers so there uh, that gender thing comes in midwifery can play a major role in involving the father or partners during antenatal period and ensuring that they have the equal responsibility when you talk in terms of birth preparedness and complication readiness. So I think there, uh, midwifery can play a major role where they only ask the men to help the women how to do those exercises and so on and so forth, and thus involving them completely. Because looking into Indian scenarios, especially in the rural areas, you will see that it's the mother-in-law who comes or the mother comes or the sister comes but husband is standing outside. Similar thing is that we always say birth companion should be female. Why female? If the husband is ready to come help, then why not? Of course, we understand that there are issues of labor rooms being, uh, you know, but nowadays when you talk in terms of latch, you're talking about LDRs, where you are separating the cubicles or at least you're putting a curtain. And if the husband can be inside, what's wrong in that? So that's another part. We have to also put full stop on, you know, uh, whenever the uh, doctor's rounds are there, you would see that the husbands are pushed outside and the only female is uh, waiting inside. Why? If the husband wants to know everything about the baby, why not? And midwifery can play a major role as far as these things are concerned. Another thing is that once the midwifery model is set in and we realize that paternal role is equal, 
then we can of course go to the government and ask for the paternity leaves which are very minimal in some places only and not uh, really as a routine so that is what see we are doing kangaroo uh, we say kangaroo mother care but the kangaroo care is being given by the fathers also where we can involve them so there are so much more uh, you know to have both the genders look into everything and midwifery playing a major role uh, ensuring that the gender inequity uh, is taken care of thank you so much thank you Renika, anything to add? Mm -hmm. Ma'am, uh, I would like to say that uh, everything is addressed by our, uh, our speakers. And uh, one thing I would like to add is, uh, in this way, uh, a woman is empowering a woman through this uh, midi free program. Uh, these women are with the women in their crucial time when they actually need a support of someone. So ma'am, uh, and this is a life-changing experience. They remember their ex experience of giving birth throughout their life. So ma'am, at that point of time, if uh, if someone like midwives are there with the mother, uh, it will give them a very positive uh, birth experience. With that, the presence of uh, NPM role model uh, uh, and mentors can inspire future generation to uh, to join this midwifery uh, career and uh, a related field. So I think, ma'am, and, and they, they, they could work as a leader, you know, a leader and, uh, and they can advocate for the women. And I think uh, they can do wonders. That's what I can say. Thank you. And we have exactly 15 minutes left for questions. I can see one from Anshu Kumari about communicating with the communities and adolescents. Anshu, do you want to come in and voice over? your question and please feel free to speak in any language that you're comfortable in. Just be bhasha mein aap chaate hain, bol sakte hain, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, actually, I'm working with Breakthrough uh, and uh, our target groups are, you know, adolescent youths and community people, especially parents. So, uh, I'm because um, I when I was working with Care India, I I used to attend these meetings and still I'm attending these meetings. But I just want to, you know, bring this issue with uh, our own target groups now. So how can I, you know, integrate in our sessions or or can I or not? I mean, so just to clarify, are you looking at an integration from, uh, you know? getting the adolescents to understand about midwifery care or getting some of them to choose midwifery as a profession or maybe both. No, 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 no. To understand, to understand. To understand. To aware them, yeah. So I'm looking to Aprajita, hopefully, you know, if you can answer that question and then anybody else. There are, I think, two more questions that are there. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, Anjita, the communication has to happen with the entire community. I am one person who's absolutely against considering adolescent girls as mothers in waiting. Um, if you get my, you know, so I would thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, adolescent girls are much more than mothers in for our country, right? So I think all women. <laughs> yes. So so I just think that the communication has to be very very specific when we are reaching out to the community. And how do we place the midwife as we have spoken today? It is a women centric care model. It is a model which reduces over medicalization. Uh, it's a model where the provider walks with you throughout the journey. I think even if we can uh, just communicate these three messages, we would have women opting for midwifery services. Uh, I think they need to kind of feel secure um, that they are it's, it's person centric care. But if other panelists might like to add. So uh, I'll go through the questions in the chat first before I come to you, Dia. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Manju has actually asked a question on the legal protection, and that's something you brought up, Aprajata, and we, we agreed upon that right now our legal uh, system does not really recognize that kind of autonomy. And God forbid, should things go wrong, you know, who will be held responsible and accountable? Uh, 
So I am going to probably ask Dr. Poonam to respond to this and then Renuka, given you are like on different uh, sides of the same coin of, you know, what do, what do you understand about the legal provisions on this? One, what are the challenges? What are you doing now? And what, I mean, we know probably what the future should look like, but any ideas on that? Dr. Poonam? Yes. Thank you, Anjita. Uh, see, uh, I'm not yet able to understand that if we can support the first year resident who's coming after the NEET examination and doesn't know anything about the, uh, not even how to put the cannula, because nowadays you all know with the NEET examination, even internship is not so critically done the way we have done it. So if we can support them, why we cannot support a midwife who's actually a trained one She's been a nurse. She's been doing BSc nursing, MSc nursing. So I think these legal issues are going to be there, whether you are an obstetrician or you are a nurse or you are a midwife. But it is just that leadership and support which the obstetrician of that particular area has to give. Unless you have this kind of approach, probably, you know, that blame game will continue. But I personally feel, and this is what we have done, that, uh, you know, uh, taking up the responsibility of that particular unit in charge that particular day, the obstetrician, if there is something going wrong, uh, they should immediately be called and they should be the one to look into. Now, question is that sometimes some midwives have tried to do a little more than their limitation. So it's also very important that the midwives understand that this is my limitation. And beyond this, if I try, it may create an issue for me. So they should call two people more. Uh, like, you know, they can call the resident doctors, they can call the obstetrician. But legal responsibility at this moment, the way our national guidelines are, uh, it has to be taken by the obstetrician in charge on that particular day. Thank you. And Renuka, you can come in and... Um, yeah, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have called you. Sorry, I'm um, asking the question uh, a person also to just be on camera. I can't see her, but after she speaks, after Renuka speaks, maybe uh, Manju, we can see you on camera. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, ma'am. Uh, I'm totally agree with the ma'am because the uh, scope of practice has been given to us. So we need to uh, practice in the boundary of our scope of practice. And if, and uh, in that, it is very clearly mentioned where till what we can do and where we can collaboratively do and at what time uh, point of time we have to refer. So uh, midwife should be very much aware of scope of practice that uh, till where her limitation is. And in case anything uh, goes wrong or if, if mother need immediate care, there should be some doctor uh, to inform and collaboratively uh, they can take care of that mother. That's what uh, I can say. Thank you. So basically, uh, you know, we don't have the needed legal requirements in place and we are working with the current legal system of which actually places it on the OBGYN and uh, that's why we need champions. So Manju, you could say hello so that you come on to the larger screen for everyone. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone, Good and thank you so much for this lively discussion. And uh, as I was traveling, so I thought, let me join. And okay. it's a pleasure hearing a lot of confidence in Renuka and scope of practice is there, but I still feel it is individual. We don't have uh, champions like uh, Dr. Poonam, many. We have, but not many. And it, it remains to the individualistic decisions that how I behave, I may be very different or some of strategies are very, very different and we need to have legal protection. I'm sure that uh, a committee must be working on it. There must be some provision of providing legal protection. Soon it will be there. Uh, that's what we are expecting and there are a lot of high hopes from NNMC and let's see. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manju. We are ho all of us are hoping quite a lot from NNMC yeah. and when it gets implemented. Thank you so much. Uh, we have seven minutes and I think I can see at least three questions and uh, Dia's hand was also up. Uh, there was one question on leadership 
uh, for midwives and I really don't know who to direct it to. Uh, it's more of a question that I know we worked with a Prajita and a team on this. So maybe that's the team that wants to come in or anyone else, but we'll have to keep it really short so that we can get to two or three more. Um, Anchita has spoken about, you know, what we need to do for leadership. Maybe you want to pass it on to someone who haven't, who wants to talk about the leadership. Uh, yeah. Anybody else, any thoughts, uh, Janvi? If it, it, it... I think leadership ties, if, if you don't mind me tying it back to the previous question, so the question was specifically on how does the law protect midwives if things go wrong? Actually, right now, the law protects midwives entirely because as of now, midwives don't have medical legal liability anymore than nurses, right? Like a nurse who has an RNRM license, the midwifery credential, unless it doesn't give any more autonomy legally. It's actually the obstetricians who are not protected in a way because the legal liability will finally fall only on obstetricians in the current medical legal setup. And this is a disservice to everybody because um, on the one hand, the incentive structure is not great for midwives. Right? Ideally, you do want them to be legally responsible for what is in their scope. And at the same time, then the future of midwifery hinges entirely on obstetricians coming on board. And like the reliance yeah. on the need for obstetric champion is very high because Unless and until that obsession just trust that I will be medical legally liable for what you do. And unless until they put that trust in the midwives, it becomes hard for midwives to grow. So definitely, I think one of the first things for midwifery leadership is if, if there is some way to push forth. So, I mean, maybe very hard to change the legal autonomous scope, but that is something at least in the long term that we collectively do need to work on. Um you know, generally giving women op lead midwives opportunities, even at simple things like with, with policy roundtables, at conferences, at panels such as these, these are good initial steps to be that they should be the face of the profession rather than many of us in NGOs and policymakers who are, of course, doing a lot of work, but uh, we'd like to see Renuka here. And it would be wonderful if, you know, just through all these conferences and panels that we organize itself, this midwives can take a greater role for sure. Um, and I think one thing which is important both for the growth of midwifery and for the growth of midwifery leaders as is what India spoke to is pay. In Karnataka, for example, we are the at this point we are struggling with an issue where there is no willingness to pay NPMs more. Trained midwives are not being paid more than nurses at all. So when your salary does, and when your financial rewards don't take into account that you have invested 18 months into training as a midwife, you, it'll be a huge struggle to recruit midwives at all, let alone keep them in the cadre, prevent attrition and ensure leadership. Leadership can't arise till there's at least a pool of midwives and that itself is not possible till we ensure that the credential is recognized as yeah. something providing value for which, yes, it is like a specialization and that person does need to be appropriately remunerated. So I think there are a lot of groundwork and interim steps are needed first on the way, along the way, at least those midwives who we do have trained, it's wonderful to see them on more stages and I hope that continues. In the meantime, a lot more groundwork needs to be done as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Anjita, I can just add a, add a sentence. Yeah. I think along with, you know, technical training, etc., we have to invest in training, you know, kind of instilling leadership skills in a way, creating an enabling environment. How do we create advocacy spaces for the midwives to speak for themselves, for the women that they take care about? How can we support midwives to lead research in the country? Uh, you know, I think I think so. There is all of us need to invest in support, stand behind. We should not be speaking for midwives. Uh, you know, we should be supporting them in taking over these leadership positions and talking for themselves. Back to you. Thank you. And hopefully, in the next webinar, we will have more than Indy and Renuka, and not people like us. So they should be speaking for themselves. Anjita, uh, I could share an experience if we have time. No, uh, I've got my hands up. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, uh, I'm going back to, sorry, I'm just going back to the organizers to say if you yeah. are unable to reach to all questions, how do you manage that in such webinars? Do you respond to them or do you extend it by five, seven minutes? I mean, we extend it. This has been so wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if the speakers can stay on for about five to seven minutes and if they continue, is it okay? Game, that'd yeah. be wonderful. I can yeah. stay on. I don't know about the others. If you can and if sure. the audience can, that'd be wonderful. But yeah, five, seven minutes is totally possible. Thank you. Yes, Cindy, please go ahead. So, sorry, you've got my passion going because with leadership, then you need to create roles for the midwives. You need to create roles 
for them to develop career progressions that they, they become uh, the heads of department and you know separate from nursing because you've got a separate profession so in order to get more midwives into the profession is now's the time to create a career career progression for, for them and one day uh, I would see an NPM in my position as a director of midwifery that's how it needs to be yes and as I say inshallah to that and let's hope the law provides for that Let's hope the country also takes into account direct entry midwifery and lots of there. Let's hope here. So there are a lot of questions in here, but uh, I think those came in after Dia raised her hand. So Dia, do you want to go ahead? And I hope I'm reading the name correctly. Even with my reading glasses, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yes, please. Hello, I'm Audible. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... To all of you for addressing uh, this very important uh, concept and unpacking the importance of midwives. So I am Dia. I am uh, working as a design researcher at Vihara Innovation Network and uh, working closely with BMGF itself uh, for a project uh, of family planning. So, um, so like we were doing our background research and understood the importance of midwives, hence I wanted to raise the question. So um, uh, in, in the session, one question was about that, uh, what is, uh, like if our midwives accepted and embraced by hospitals. So then my uh, question is about, are, uh, are they also been accepted by mothers and, uh, you know, father uh, in the process? Um, and uh, because of the fact uh, you have also mentioned that it is in initial stage, the setup is in initial stage. So what is their ac um, acceptance rate? And uh, then um, the scope of work, is it just limited to um, like their scope of work? Is, li is it limited to after uh, the mother gets pregnant or before the pregnancy as well? And uh, how do they initiate the conversation with fathers and make them comfortable? Um, so, yeah, and the information of sexual and reproductive health. Um, I could answer the first part, and I think that was answered by the some of the panelists earlier about acceptance by women. And I think Gita answered this where mothers who've gone through this experience come back and ask for the women in pink, you know, who supported them. So I think gradually it's growing and they understand the difference. And I have heard anecdotally about women who had their first deliveries, you know, through non-midwife uh, led care, but subsequent, and they understand the difference. So because it's in relatively fewer places, we probably don't have good enough documentation or data on this, but gradually, you know, we would be bringing in that uh, bit. We also heard about acceptance in hospitals from our, you know, how it's gradually growing and the other professionals are accepting. Um, and yes, there is a definite scope of, uh, you know, midwives actually looking across the spectrum of a woman's reproductive life and that does not need to include pregnancy but from a country's perspective that's what we've started off with and in a way I would say we are also contributing to the gender bias that is that views women as wombs so we start off you know when that womb becomes functional but in theory and even through the training there is a lot more that's covered including contraception uh, but maybe Gita could answer to that and Gita, I mean, we might want to just keep it very, very brief because you've designed the whole uh, training package. So uh, just to keep answer that question for her. Yeah, very specifically, I think uh, what you just said that this as a scope of practice, midwives, professional midwives, because it's a cadre which is available internationally. It's, it's in so many countries which have well-developed midwifery systems. It actually... Uh, involves the entire gamut and spectrum of sexual and reproductive health care services. So therefore, it would in involve every single aspect that you just spoke about, right, including gynecological care, which is right now, it's there, it's part of the curriculum, but it's kind of taken a backstage, because as Anchita said, the focus of the government largely has been on improving from the pregnancy up to the postnatal period. In fact, uh, uh, I worked in the NHS for several years and I didn't see a gynecologist for a certain problem. I went to a midwife, you know, in a sexual reproductive health clinic. And I was super satisfied. And that was the end of it. So that is the way to go, definitely. 
uh, in the years to come. But this is a slowly growing and slowly evolving profession. It's not going to happen overnight. And where you see well-developed models, which are well-functioning models, they have also taken a long time to come to age. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for addressing that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I didn't realize I was speaking on mute, but thank you for that question also. So there is a question on um, compassionate, a module on compassionate care. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to speak to it? Uh, and then probably I can request Geeta to answer that again quickly, just because it's like looking at it from a modular lens and maybe Indy can also come in because she's also worked on some of the training modules. Yeah. Stephanie, you asked that question. Do you want to voice it over? It's okay, Gita. Go ahead. Respond, please. Okay, so I think... Yes, yes. Is... I... Sorry. Hi, okay. Stephanie here. Is yes, it audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay, Gita, go ahead. Answer. Sorry, there is some, some issues in connecting with you. Okay. So that's my question is... Uh, in the Bihar set of I'm working continuously in the last 10 to 12 years. So okay. when compass the training regarding just I want to know about that. Here yes. we are just facing the so many issues regarding the compassionate. The nurses are continuously getting the training and day to day place service also here so supporting and in service education also supporting. But the main issues behind that is attitude. The woman having the rights to get the quality care and respect care, the privacy and confidence. Even the nurses are knowing, after knowing also, they are not providing. It's not in practice. So where, how we are going to improve in that? Is that any specific module you define? If you are defining also the module also, we are going to deliver in the knowledge based on it. It's the theory part. So practice me kaise leke anjayengi? So that is my question. Uh, I don't think there's a module that we have. I mean, it's like uh, from a package perspective, and Geeta can correct me if I'm wrong, it's weaved in or rather forms the base of all other modules. And secondly, it's um, shown or exhibited by the tutors and the trainers themselves. And you just learn by mimicking or, you know, that's, that's what you embrace, whatever your teachers are doing. That's how uh, it's done. So it's a lived experience is what I understand. And even during the training, you know, the whole, and Gita, you can talk about students versus learners. I love that example of yours. <laughs> okay. So may I add one thing? Are we going to connect that the compassionate care as a one of the curriculum in the pre-service education part in the GNM, ANM? Because there is the curriculum part it's not having specially, specifically regarding the compassionate care. So whether we can approach the Indian Nursing Council to add this part. <laughs> Tough question, but I think we have quite a few nurses on board and maybe you should all get together and say this is something that needs to be included, uh, whether individually or through TNAI or through SOMI or somebody and, you know, talk to INC, which would soon change to NNMC. But yes, I agree with you. Gita, please. Yeah, and then thanks, last Jeffrey. question to end. Thank yeah. you. And you, I think you made some excellent points here. So responding to your question, whether there is a module on compassionate care, yes. So the INC has actually developed a, a unit called respectful maternity care, right? But the argument here is that if you box it inside a unit and then forget about the rest of it, um, you know, then it's not really respectful care. So uh, the way it's the entire package, the training package is devised, developed, is that it weaves through, as Anjita rightly said, all the way from the beginning to the end. So it is really how you speak with the woman, you don't talk to her, and even the smallest of nuances, you know, you don't use the word patient. Similarly, we were very, very careful in not using the word student and teacher, because again, you're developing a certain hierarchical dynamic here. It was a facilitator and a learner. So respect is not only with the woman, with the partner, partner with the family, but it's equally so between, between your peers, colleagues, as well as with the teachers. And some of the teachers could actually be younger and you could have some learners who are really older in, you know, age-wise. So how are you going to then 
uh, ensure that you're embodying that. So the pathway of competency-based education is knowledge, skills, and practice, or rather attitudes, which are now called as behaviors, right? So you can't measure an attitude. And as, uh, as, you, as you already heard, that this is something that has to be modeled. Behavior is all about modeling. And therefore, it was despite the fact that the program started just you know, before COVID, the government held off uh, in rolling it out as a national initiative and saying, no, it's not going to be taught by a bunch of obstetricians or nurses who, who are trained as obstetrical nurses, but rather it's going to be midwives who teach midwives and help them to role model each and every aspect of that woman-centered uh, compassionate care, which is done in a very skillful manner, keeping the woman's needs and values at the core center of midwifery. And that's actually took a height as it was nearly about a year and a half's gap before uh, when we were we were tasked all of our all partners, you know, to help and support with bringing in international midwives who actually embody that so that people who are learning it learn by doing and not just sitting in a classroom, as you rightly said if it sticks to a classroom it's never going to have a change out there thank you and angel last question to you and before we close i just wanted to come in and and say dr kokoi has to leave uh but i, want I to know just quickly, thank you uh great uh yeah but anyone please feel free to leave i just want to quickly come in and say thank you very much everyone we will continue for a few more minutes but thank you for joining if you need to leave please feel free to do that Yes, Over thank you. you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm Chandi, do you need to leave or do you, do you want to respond? Okay, that's okay. So, okay. yeah, so I'm Angel from Institute of Public Health, Bangalore. I've been, uh, we have been evaluating the midwives training program in Telangana and Orissa for the last six months. It is um, last six years. I mean, uh, it is amazing to see how midwifery is rolling up across the country. Uh, so one quick question is like, uh, I see now several states have come forward in the implementation of the program. And there are different learnings that each state has learned in in, um, in implementing it. And there are success stories and there are challenges that they face and how they came out, out of it. So is there, uh, I mean, is there any currently something that is connecting everything together in, in the cross learning? And uh, is there any monitoring frameworks? These are my two questions and would love to hear about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Angel. That's a lovely question. And uh, given my love for data, I mean, I could probably take a crack at it. I wish we had a very well-defined monitoring framework, but say other than numbers of um, midwives trained, et cetera, we don't really have such a framework within the government. As far as learning from each other, and there were multiple partners supporting the Government of India initiative. So at the partner level, we tried to bring together all the partners to share the challenges, to think through uh, potential solutions that somebody might have worked on. But Unfortunately, it, it wasn't a very structured uh, partnership and we couldn't do it as regularly as we wanted. Initially, even the government tried to bring people together to learn and to you know build that continuous improvement of how the program is doing. And then COVID struck and things. And then we, now we've had a change in leadership, even at the government level. So that's where some of the very, very practical challenges lie. Uh, from the foundation end, what we have done is actually signed a grant with IIPH Gandhi Nagar uh, to look at the different challenges that we are facing at, like, you know, whether in Telangana or in Gujarat, West Bengal, Maharashtra. And in many places, they have also figured out innovative solutions for this. So how can we bring all that together? And now there is some space within the government to actually listen to some of this. How have, you know, even if it might be something as basic as getting the Institute approved by the Indian Nursing Council, getting, you know, certificates for the nurses, allowing them to practice. How have different states overcome this and can other states adopt such models? So if, we, if, if it's a multi, because it is a multi-departmental affair, it's not just health, it's medical education, it is state nursing councils. It is universities and many people who are engaged. So in some of the states that we work in, we have developed uh, state midwifery task forces. What is the learning there? You know, we may structure it, but do they meet? What is the kind of action that emerges? So that is a kind of um, thing we've set up pretty recently. We are honestly still awaiting the government green signal on that, because as I just mentioned, there's a change in leadership. At the highest level, we don't really have institutional memory 
uh, from the 2018 launch. And that's putting a bit of a setback. But at our end, the partners who are working on this are you know, pushing for that learning and for having a more robust monitoring mechanism. Uh, anybody who wants to just, otherwise I'll summarize the session and we're already 15 minutes, almost 15 minutes over time. Okay, so thanks Indy for that very interesting comment in the end, because when I think of respectful midwifery care, uh, and I'm now speaking from the people who we hope to serve, uh, I see, you know, if one, because again, I'm coming from a data lens. If I draw a line diagram with zero and, you know, plus one, plus two uh, on one end and the negatives on the other side, uh, I see this hitting women, abusing them definitely on the negative side. You know, that's not where we are. So reducing that would get us to zero, but that's not where the line chart for RMC ends. It's actually on a much more longer spectrum. And that spectrum is where midwifery comes in. It is about recognizing the agency of women. It is about recognizing the autonomy on their own bodies. That's why the, the questions on family planning, the questions of going beyond maternity care, what we are telling women, and by bringing in the men, by bringing in the partners, you know, building that sense of shared um, sexual and reproductive health and building that together for a couple if required or for the woman alone, you know, as the case may be, and we do it on an individual basis. That is what this intervention means to me. And as an ethos, I wish that this gets transmitted across professions. So I'm hopeful that as we work in, an, in a collaborative environment in different facilities, we kind of start having that diffusion slash osmotic effect that other professions also learn what it means to really accord respect for the patients and the clients even though your clients are genuine patients, I mean, it may be cancer, they still have the right to decide, right? So that kind of an understanding and just being with people is something that we really need to understand is so much more important than, you know, uh, I, won't, I shouldn't say than, but equally important as, you know, learning how to cut and suture and sew and give medicines. So those skills are important, but these skills are also very, very important. Also from the lens, as Indy, you said, it is all, pregnancy is one area where it's not a disease, it's physiological. It is supported infinitely by nature itself. And if we can support nature to give that kind of an environment where the natural hormones flow, why do we ask women to breastfeed in peace? Because we know oxytocin flows in that kind of an environment. But we forget that it's the same oxytocin when the woman is in labor. So how can we hit her and expect the oxytocin to flow and her to undergo normal contractions? It's going to stop or it's going to, you know, go all haywire. And then we say, oh, uncooperative patient. So we don't want to get into that kind of scenario. Give that natural environment as far as possible. Put her in a calm, cool space where she can do what she's set out, setting out to do and live the way she wants to, birth the way she wants to. But be ready, knowing that there is a potential complication that could happen. Keep a watch, but don't intervene unless needed. And just from the provider lens, um, I'm hoping that they, the midwives, given that they are probably one who lead the beacon with, at least on the international front, having the autonomy. So they can lead and speak for many other women uh, providers. And we do have a hierarchy in the health system. So even speaking, say, for the male nurses, Etc. And uh, you know, just just building that equality and rising within um, the whole spectrum of you know leadership, etc. And genuinely, I mean, not granting people a space for the sake of it, but genuinely making them spokespersons for themselves and their professions, and understanding that every profession has a space here, and it's not like we are creating grades or, as somebody mentioned, you know, mini OBGYNs or higher nurses. No, that's not the idea. If with this profession, it is a separate profession looking at they have their job to do. Gita, again, borrowing some of the words, then, you know, Gita and I work pretty closely together. For midwives, she calls them specialists in normality. And I genuinely believe that they do it probably better than OBGYNs. What probably? I'm 100% sure they do it better than OBGYNs. So if we can build that space, ensure rightful salaries, and, you know, those should be givens 
you should have a job, you should have a designation, you should be paid according to what you're doing, and then building on the leadership skills and developing the voice and hoping to get there. So just I'll end there. Uh, are women a production line? No. <laughs> but and that's exactly what I'm saying. It's across the spectrum. It's across a woman's life. And I would go beyond women. It's not a man versus woman kind of thing. But even men who are patients or who need care should deserve that care. We don't need to show our men out of the labor room. They were part of the process and engage them. They need to be part of the process. If we need to see a social transformation, this could be a good starting point and not leave women to care for babies and being mothers. So I'll end here. We are quite a bit over time. Uh, but thank you everyone for whoever stayed on. And this has been a really, really delightful session and some very, very interesting questions. Thank you so much. Rohan, any parting thoughts from your yeah. end as the organizers? I'd like to also thank uh, all the speakers uh, and, and our moderator, Dr. Ajita Patil, uh, also uh, Dr. Keita for bringing on Renu. Uh, as, as Anjita said, we'd love for Renu to have the next session holding for us uh, to be able to set the agenda. And, and She's the next moderator. What we need more and more of. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Priya Das from OPM, uh, as well as the OPM team and the Quicksand team for, uh, yeah, for all the prep. Uh, and everyone uh, who took the time to join us and the 36 of us who are still on the call and listening to this. Uh, I hope this was useful. We'll be in touch and share more documentation. So we spread the word around this. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, OPM and Quicksand team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rohan. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you so much, ma'am, for um, making me join here. Thank you. You can drop that. Thank ma you, ma'am. <laughs> 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 we are equals, right? That's where we start. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.